Okay, everybody, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, it's right at 11 o'clock, and we want to be respectful of y'all's time. Um, we're really happy that you've joined us today for our Health Policy and Management webinar. My name is Emily Lakemaker, and I'm the Associate Director of Recruitment and Student Life here at the Rollins School of Public Health. Um, just a couple of logistics here at the top before we turn it over to our um, HPM staff, faculty, and students. Uh, we are recording this, so if you feel like you miss anything or you want to go back and um, double check on anything or re-listen, we will have this posted on our YouTube channel, usually within three to five business days of the live events. Um, and we will email, I'll email out the link to that um, once we get it live on the on the website or on the YouTube channel. I'll email out, that, email out that link to everyone that's registered, so look for that here in the next few days. Um, up in the top right hand corner of your screen, you can see where my cursor is. Um, you can have the opportunity to type in any questions that you have. Feel free to do that throughout the webinar and then once we get through the PowerPoint presentation of this, we'll go through and read your questions aloud and um, go through our, pan our student panelists and faculty and staff that are here and answer them. And we'll get through as many as we can in the hour that's allotted. And if we don't get to your question, if we don't have time, um, our contact information will be provided and you can, um, we can reach out to you directly to make sure that um, we get all of your questions answered. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Blake, um, who is one of our, who is the department chair. I wish I was the department chair. Director. No, you got it. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to share with you some information about the Department of Health Policy and Management here at Rollins School of Public Health. As Emily mentioned, my name is Sarah Blake. I'm an assistant professor here in the department. Um, I'm also the director of the MPH and the MSPH programs, and I will plan to talk with you a little bit about the differences between those programs in a few minutes. I wanted to let you know I'm also joined by Kathy Woolenzine, our department advisor and curriculum advisor as well, and also two wonderful students, Brittany Perkins and Garrett Sal, who will be available to answer any questions, which I think are the most important questions about what it's like to be a student here at Rollins and in the Department of Health Policy and Management. So what we'll be doing is really um, taking a few minutes right now to give you a broad overview of the Department of Health Policy and Management. We'll spend some time with the curriculum so you understand what uh, differentiates an MPH and an MSPH, but also what options you have if you've chosen or are choosing to come here for your MPH in terms of health policy versus management. But I wanted to first just give you an overview. Um, the Department of Health Policy and Management is a program uh, in the Rollins School of Public Health that really focuses on the finance and delivery of health care. Our curriculum is interdisciplinary in content and it provides students with a comprehensive background in both the conceptual and analytic knowledge necessary to understand and improve health status and health services delivery. We have a very interdisciplinary uh, faculty. Uh, we include faculty with expertise in economics, sociology, political science, public policy, health services and policy, medicine, and psychiatry. I, for instance, have uh, expertise in public policy, and I've been in this department going on 15 years, and I work a lot with the other faculty in an interdisciplinary way to do research. I also teach two courses, one on women's health policy and one on qualitative methods in health services research. So I want to just give a, a broad overview of the curriculum and the different types of programs that we have um, that we offer here in the department. Our first program, the Masters of Public Health program, is a 42 credit hour program that allows students to choose either a policy or a management track. Both of those tracks are two years. You may also choose a 12 month accelerated health management track. All of those programs do require a capstone, which is like a practicum. Health policy and management is a very practice-oriented discipline. We believe that working in the field provides one of the most, if not the important, most important way to really gain true knowledge and experience in this field. So the capstone, the capstone requirement um, is part of the um, curriculum, but we also believe that the practicum requirement is important as well. 
Our second program, um, which is a smaller program, is the MSPH. It's a Master's of Science of Public Health. This program requires a little bit longer uh, curriculum. It's 48 credit hours. It's really geared toward health services research. And as a result of this MSPH program, there is a thesis requirement. It is the only thesis-based uh, program in our department. We have, a, from any given year, between five to 10 students, it just depends. So it is a smaller program and it's very much geared toward uh, building expertise and health services research. So I'm going, uh, for the next couple of slides, we think it's really important uh, to differentiate the different programs, the different options you have, both in the MPH program as well as the MS PH program. So we are going to, I'm going to turn it over now to Kathy Wollenzeen to give you a real in-depth understanding of the different programs as well as the different tracks within our programs. Hello everyone, uh, this is Kathy Wollenzeen and I'm the advisor for the program. So if you'll look at the first chart that we have here on the PowerPoint, this is for the policy track. We only offer this in a two-year option and this, you can see from the layout, the program runs, um, you do fall, spring, you have the summer open to choose and do a practicum, and then you do the next fall and spring. Uh, the good thing about this program, a lot of students come in and they're undecided, and they may tell me I'm interested, uh, Kathy, a little bit in management, I may want policy, but you'll notice from these charts, the first fall semester is identical for both the policy and the management track, so students have that option to decide during the first semester upon arrival to choose which track they would like to pursue. So that has worked out uh, to the uh, advantage of students to be able to have a time in the fall semester to be able to experience the classes and get a taste of both policy and management. And everyone decides which track they want to go in at that time, so that is enough experience in the classroom. Um, the curriculum is laid out clearly. All classes marked in pink on the PowerPoint are required HPM classes. As Sarah stated earlier, it's 42 credit hours in order to achieve the, the uh, MPH. The blue classes are core classes like you've taken in undergrad. We have a biostatistics, an epidemiology, a global health, behavioral science, health ed, and environmental health. So those are flexible and can be moved around a little bit. The bios has to come the first semester, but there's some flexibility with the schedule. And you will see as well, here we have electives. And we like for you to look at what electives would be offered in HPM. However, you do have the option to take electives across departments of public health. We love for students to get to experience if they have an interest in the behavioral science, health ed area, or even global health. So you're allowed to take electives outside of HPM, and I think that's a great plus in order to allow you to get the skill set you wish. So the next slide would be, um, let's see, the MPH in our management track. You see here, this is a, the two-year option as well. It lay, it's laid out the same as the policy track, but the classes change in the uh, first spring semester. So you again come in, all students take the same thing, and then they change during the spring semester. And then the summer will be, we'll go over in a moment what a practicum is. And then you have your two capstone courses that we mentioned earlier. And there's a lot of group work on the management track in order to uh, complete the capstone, which is a culminating experience that takes everything that you did uh, first fall semester and spring, and then when you get to your last uh, fall and spring, you'll have a capstone in strategic management and then one in operations management. And you'll be at doing projects that will entail all the coursework that you've taken previously and build on that. So it's a great uh, culminating experience. And then the next option is again the one option that we have which is called the accelerated program it actually runs fall spring summer it is a 12-month option students are allowed to come in straight from undergrad or have years of experience i get that question a lot from students saying do i have to have years of experience we usually have a cohort of 10 to 12 students that choose this 12-month option. And upon graduation, they'll go on, we'll show some different opportunities and where people have been placed. But it is the same uh, curriculum, 42 credits. Now, a couple challenges are you're going to be busy with coursework. So what you're doing is just kind of 
pushing it all together to get it done in three semesters as opposed to four. And you'll see that you'll be taking classes during your summer, which that will have you be in Atlanta. <clears throat> you will not be able to have a free summer session to go abroad to do a practicum or to another city. It just ties you to Atlanta, which is not a bad thing. There's plenty of opportunities, but that's just something to pay attention to. And then our last option is the uh, research degree that requires a thesis. And again, this is the cohort of five to 10 students. Uh, students are evaluated for this separately. So if anyone has applied or been accepted to Rollins for this next year and are interested in being uh, considered for the MSPH, please email me or Sarah directly so we can have your file reviewed because we do look at these student populations separately. Uh, this one's very quantitative based and has the thesis requirement. So if for some reason you were not aware that this option was out there, you are welcome to uh, reach out to me and we can have your file reviewed and give you an answer usually within the week if this would be an option for you to go that direction, okay? And the next thing is the practicum. Sure, and I'll, I'll um, cover the practicum. As I started to mention earlier, um, all students are required to do a practicum. Um, the practicums, the purpose of a practicum is really to apply knowledge and skills that have been acquired through your coursework in a community-based environment. And our ideal practicum for you should relate to either your academic and or your professional interests. Um, and our practicum is designed to include very specific but well-defined competencies and learning objectives and processes to track and evaluate your student performance, your competency achievement, and practical experiences. Our practicum um, in HPM can begin as early um, as the spring semester of your first year. Most of our students, however, choose to do their practicum over the summer. The practicums can be done here in Atlanta or if you choose to go back either to your hometown or you choose a different city, as long as that practicum relates to your field of health policy and management and um, has a, you know, a primary supervisor, a qualified field su supervisor that can oversee the work that you're doing in the field, that is fine. We have a lot of opportunities here in Atlanta to do your practicums. We are literally next door to the CDC. Many of our students choose their practicum, practica in um, the field of public health, at, such as this federal agency. Some of our students decide to work in other consulting firms. Other opportunities do exist in Atlanta to do your practicum. Most of the potential opportunities are in agencies and organizations that include um, state, federal, and local public health agencies. Um, and again, you can look to nonprofits, um, consulting groups, et cetera. Important thing to note about the practicum, um, you are required to work a minimum of two hours um, under the supervision of your experienced field supervisor and under the guidance of a student department advisor. You would be and will be um, assigned a practicum advisor um, so that you can get a little bit of guidance about how to choose your practicum and what is required. Many of our students, however, do choose to go beyond the 200 hours. Um, we recommend no more than 400 hours just because we want you to focus, of course, on your coursework and finishing your degree. So between two and 400 hours is about the average um, work for uh, an HPM practicum. Um, we do have here um, two great students in our department, uh, Brittany Perkins, who is a second year health policy student, and Garrett South, who is a first year health management student. I will let them just very briefly introduce themselves. Okay. <clears throat> I'm Brittany Perkins. Um, I am from small town Iowa. I came here. Um, for the opportunities, I thought Rollins was a fantastic school, and I'm strongly policy, so I can help answer some questions with that. Um, if you have questions about practicum, I've already finished my practicum as well over the summer. Um, and I need, oh, sorry, I did my practicum at a, um, a consumer watchdog um, in downtown Atlanta called Georgia Watch, where they really watch out for vulnerable populations in Atlanta. Um, I helped finish a report that they had been working on. So it was a really great opportunity for me to work with some research, also get a little experience with policy, and kind of work with vulnerable populations. And 
have something, um, a deliverable at the end to really showcase my work on. Good morning, everyone. My name is Garrett South. I'm a first year management student. I'm from Long Beach, California, so I can speak to those um, traveling from the West Coast. Um, I'm also the department representative for Student Government Association here. Um, and so I am I am a student face for the department. Um, and I'm also a student council member for the Socio-Contextual Determinants of Health Certificate. Um, so I could speak to you guys about some of the campus leadership opportunities available here. I'm still searching for a practicum currently. Um, but I am an intern at Healing Community Center, which is in West Atlanta, a federally qualified health center. So I can speak also about how it is balancing work and um, school during your first year. And I should say, I also am working, um, I am at the CDC, so if you have questions about that, I'm there currently with my um, internship through the REAL program. So. Well, thank you, Garrett, and thank you, uh, Brittany. I really encourage you to ask questions um, when the time comes so that you can get a good sense of what it's like, um, as many of the things that they've said about practicum, about jobs, about um, just the certificate programs that we offer here um, at the Rollins School of Public Health. Um, and, and this question comes up a lot, so I, we thought we would go ahead and address it in terms of what do people do with their MPH or MSPH. We just have a list here of some examples of what our alumni do after their Rollins experience. For those who um, have received an MPH program, our students um, go into consulting, we, they go and work for government organizations such as the Government Accounting Office, CDC of course is, is one that uh, many of our um, students um, uh, end up working at, either through the ORIs fellowships or, or jobs that uh, eventually come out of those fellowships. Humana, Kaiser Permanente, so certainly health, um, health plans and health management organizations are opportunities for our students. Um, we've had students that go to DC and work for the Department of Health and Human Services, the federal agency, uh, federal health care agency for the United States. And then we have a number of our students that stay here and work at the Emory Healthcare Clinic. We have a lot of opportunities, not only during your time here through internships and fellowships, but Emory Healthcare Clinic is a great opportunity, particularly for our health management students. For our uh, MSPH alumni, our students have gone to work for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. That is the federal agency that uh, administers both Medicare and Medicaid. They also have worked in the consulting world. We've had students go work at the Georgia Health Policy Center as um, research associates. We've had a number of students that choose to come into the MSPH as a sort of initial training ground for a doctoral program. So recently we've had a student um, uh, entered a PhD program at the University of Michigan, uh, sorry, Minnesota, in health policy. We also have had um, a student recently um, enter the uh, PhD program in health services research at Brown. Uh, we also have a current student who's working at Emory Healthcare, an alumni that's working at Emory Healthcare, uh, doing um, data analytics um, within the critical care and quality research um, department. So that gives you a good overview. It's very diverse. It really has uh, a lot to uh, relate to their practicums, uh, the experiences they've had as students, and there are many opportunities. And we have a wonderful career center here that will also assist you with um, finding jobs and having an idea of what's available to you as a HPM alumni. Um, before we um, end, I wanted to mention that we have a number of certificate programs here available to HPM students at the Rollins um, School. These are programs that allow you to really um, specify and focus your MPH degree. Um, those uh, certificate programs are listed here. Most of them just require uh, an application. I will mention that the Certificate in Maternal and Child Health, which is the last one that's listed here, does, is a competitive certificate program. It is a program that only accepts about 20 students. However, it is a, uh, a program now that is part of the Center for Excellence in uh, women, uh, Maternal and Child Health. Emory received a very broad, very big grant from um, the Department of Health and Human Services. So within the Certificate of Maternal and Child Health, um, if you are accepted, there are uh, financial uh, scholarship opportunities. It's a very um, important and 
uh, but competitive certificate program. So I, I wanted to, to mention that. But all of these are very, very popular with our students. As Garrett mentioned, he's in the Certificate in Socio-Contextual uh, Socio Determinants of Health. He can uh, speak to you about uh, why he chose that and how his experience has been so far. Our students also are very interested in the Certificate in Mental Health. That program is um, facilitated in part by one of our faculty members, uh, Benjamin Dress, who is a psychiatrist in training and also a professor. But all of these are uh, available to you. I believe there are a couple actually that are still in development. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a wonderful opportunity to really focus um, your studies here while at Rollins. And um, that's it. Again, here's some information for how to reach us, both uh, Kathy Wollenzine and myself. We really welcome hearing from you, of course, now. But it, after this webinar, if you'd like any other questions uh, answered, please feel free to reach out to us. All right, so we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions now. Um, hopefully, you guys have been typing some in. It looks like it. So just continue to type these in into the question box, and we will go through. Um, we're going to read them aloud and then let our panelists answer them. And we'll address as many as we can here in the time that we have allotted. So to start off with, um, Christopher is asking, for waitlisted MPH applicants, is there an expected timeline for when we should ex expect a final decision? Yes, I can answer that. This is Kathy speaking. Uh, yes, for students that have been placed on the waitlist in HPM, we will look at them at the end of March. Uh, at the list because we will have deposits at that time. Our goal in HPM is to accept 90 students into the program. So we're working with that list so that it makes it a great uh, experience for students. So we're trying, you know, it always give or take is up a few or down a few, but that's how we work our wait list. So if we have spaces available, it will be offered by the end of March. And I will contact you directly. And if you have any uh, information that you would like to provide or state your interest, you can certainly email me directly. You've got my contact information stating that you're interested still in attending Rollins. All right, and then Christopher's got a couple of questions about working. So I think we can kind of address these in one shot. Um, how feasible is it to maintain a job while completing the MPH program? And then he's also saying that um, I currently work as a staff um, for staff div with Health and Human Services, and would like to and would likely seek a transfer to the CDC to work while completing the program. Would my current work conflict with the requirements of the practicum? Okay, I can answer this too. This is Kathy speaking again. Uh, when it comes to working, you can if you're going to work full time, then you can pursue an MPH on a part time basis. And that's where you would work with me closely on what you're doing to make sure because certain classes are only offered in the first fall semester. And as I mentioned earlier, classes build upon one another. So you can't take capstone when you haven't taken everything else. So there is a method to what has to be taken in order. Your question in regards to the practicum, if you're working at CDC, of course that's something that will be eligible for practicum, but for us, what we require is an additional something outside of your job that will be relevant to public health and will enhance your resume in a different direction. You're not supposed to use current employment as your practicum, so we can work with you closely and maybe a possibility of when you're still at CDC, you can take on an additional project that will increase the skill set that we can approve for a practicum. All right, Archana is asking, can we apply for certificate programs in the middle of our academic year, or should it be chosen before we matriculate? So this is Garrett, um, first year management student. I have the certificate in social determinants of health. Each certificate program is run a little bit differently. so. That list that's provided on this PowerPoint, you can go and each program has its own website where you can kind of see the layout, um, which classes you need to take, what are the application requirements, if they have any. Um, I can speak personally from my certificate program. You are allowed to um, enroll into the certificate program in the middle of the school year. We prefer you do it in the beginning because by the end of the school year, you have a couple of different events you need to attend and maybe a class or an elective um, that is easier to sit, fit into your schedule if you do it in the earlier of the semester. Um, but as I said, each certificate program is run a little bit differently, so make sure to check out those websites. Yeah, and just to kind of um, piggyback on Garrett, some do require a, an application process um, and some require even that 
your thesis be related to um, to that certificate program in order to complete it. So um, we have a page on our website, I think it's in the academic section, um, that lists all of our certificates and kind of goes more into detail um, on if it's something one you, one you can just more or less declare and sign up to do or one if it's more application based. Um, Archana is asking, do international students have to be on F1 visas or can they study while on an H4? I'm not very familiar with this, but if no one else is, I can certainly find out for, for you. Are you familiar, Kathy? F1? Okay, great. So F1. All right, Nilofer is asking, can you talk a little bit about, a little bit about student organizations on campus? I bet Garrett can. <laughs> <laughs> There's there are, yeah. um, and it's a growing list. I am part of a couple of different clubs on campus. Just, I forgot to mention why I came here. Um, so I came to Rollins because I really wanted to address social determinants of health. So that was my real passion in the field of public health. Um, but I was gaining more management skills through my undergrad. So I wanted to really make a change on a broader, more institutional wide um, area focus. Um, what was the question again? Sorry. Student org. Student org, sorry. <laughs> so coming here with that, driven with that passion, I found a couple of student organizations that I'm part of. I'm part of Students for Social Justice. I'm also part of the Association um, of Black Public Health Students. And those different organizations, we have time to meet, we volunteer in the community. Um, it really lets you explore your passions and have meetings with like-minded individuals. Um, and there's lots of events going on at all times here on campus. We have a bridge that connects our two buildings and it is constantly filled with free things, free food is very big here. Um, I don't know if anyone is a foodie, but there, the tip during orientation was to just have a Tupperware in your bag at all times awesome. because there are so many student organizations now that you can, at the end of lunchtime, just find free lunch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a southern thing. We have to feed people. Oh, yeah. it's a real thing down here. <laughs> and um, just to kind of add to that, so we've got, I think right now, there's 19 official chartered organizations within Rollins. Um, and that, like Gary said, that list is continuing to grow. So, um, you know, it's very easy to get involved. It's highly encouraged to get involved. Public health overall is a pretty small field. So the students that you're going, the students in your cohort, these are going to be your colleagues, you know, for the rest of your professional career. You'll be working with and for these people, you know, as you move up in your career. So it's a really good time to um, get to know them outside of a classroom environment. So we really do encourage that. Our Student Government Association hosts events um, every month. We have what's called Convos on Tap, which is just a time um, to get together with everybody, both faculty and students. And they provide um, alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks and some catered food in. And it's held on Fridays, one Friday a month from 5 to 7. They also do kind of like we call them public health proms, basically. Mm -hmm. Our, uh, we have a spring formal and a fall formal. Um, and so those are a lot of fun. And then the student clubs themselves host various events, some more on the social side. But we have um, our reproductive rights group did a phenomenal conference last November and had amazing speakers come. And it was the first one that they did, but it was such a success. We'll be doing it again. Um, we have networking nights. We have uh, speak, you know, like lunch and learn speakers. So uh, I think people tend to think of grad school often as a bit of a kind of commuter type experience. You know, you show up, you go to class, and you leave. And Rollins certainly isn't like that. It, it's very much a community, and people are just here a lot. <laughs> As Emily said, there are so many events that are happening. You can live your whole day on campus. <laughs> I do. Um, there are signs at each of the elevators that are constantly advertising all of these events that she spoke about. And as I said, like you can just sit there and just fill up your calendar with mm -hmm. just staying on campus and being involved in various events. And we, on the Rollins website, in the, I think it's Rollins Life section, there is a page that's um, being up, that is consistently updated as new clubs get um, added. And it also has like a, a feed of the current events that are happening within those clubs. So you can get an idea of what that looks like. Um, okay, Arcana, Arcana is asking for hospital management opportunities. Which hospitals do Emory? Which hospitals do Emory students typically go? 
The answer to that is Emory Healthcare. Yes. Um, just because we have a we have a health system within Emory University, so most of our students work at Emory Healthcare. Um, some of our students do choose, however, to work at um, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, also known as CHOA. There are two campuses, both at Eggleston and um, at Scottish Rite. So we we are uh, a very um, hospital oriented city, so there are opportunities, but most of our students do come to Emory. And most of those are all very close by, yes. like to campus. Yes. Um, and if not, if it's part of the Emory Healthcare, there are shuttles that like can take you to the Midtown campus yes. if you don't have a car. Yeah, we have we have students that go another big hospital is Piedmont Hospital yes. and Northside. We've had students be placed there as well. So it's very convenient and there's a lot of opportunities, even the Gwinnett Medical Center, we've had students there as well. So another great opportunity is Grady. Grady is a hospital downtown Atlanta that is our only safety net hospital. It serves all underinsured and uninsured individuals. It is a wonderful training ground. I have worked there myself on projects and if you're interested at all in the safety net on just looking at um, access to care issues we have a lot of staff uh, or faculty that that have projects um, at Grady and there are opportunities to work at, at Grady as well yeah um, all right, Sanal is asking, oh, Sanal and I have been emailing. Hi, Sanal. I'm glad to see you on here. Hi, <laughs> Sanal. is asking, hello, I was accepted to the HPM program for this fall and have a couple of questions. Do most students stay in the Atlanta area to do their practicums? Um, are there assist is there assistance in finding practicums in other states? And how is balancing first semester courses and doing an internship? All right, so that first, let's um, take those one question at a time. Do most students stay in the Atlanta area to do their practicums? Um, I would say it's kind of 50-50 yeah. almost. Um, a lot of people do go home if they have networks um, or connections, either through previous internships. Um, some people go home. Some people take a leap and try to find something in D.C. Um, and will just kind of go that route. I stayed in Atlanta. It was just convenient for me. Um, I stayed with the organization that I had done my real internship through. Um, and they just kind of, I enjoyed the project I was working on, and so I just worked with them to stay over the summer. Um, so it's really a mixture. Um, there are opportunities to go other places if you want. You could definitely work with uh, career services on that. Um, there's the website where they post like real jobs. They'll also post um, various internships for the summers that you can find stuff on. Um, some people just found things through Googling. It's mm -hmm. really, however, you find out. Um, word of mouth also works. So it's really like a 50-50 split, I would say. Um, and then is there assistance in finding practicums in other states? So we talked a little bit about career services. Yeah, career services is great. Um, if you're feeling lost, definitely stop by and they can help you kind of find a direction. Um, their job isn't to find one for you, but they can definitely direct you towards an area. Um, of finding something. Not a placement program. Yeah, it's not a placement program, but their website is fantastic. Um, even if you don't have the real award, their website does uh, have jobs on there that are non-real awardees. Um, and real is Rollins Earn and Learn. Sorry, there's a lot of acronyms if I slip here. Um, and I would just say like word of mouth, definitely check with any networking or um, connections you have. There's also the career fair where some people find things for the summer um, through that. Those are mainly in Atlanta, but there's definitely opportunities. I know I was freaking out and I went to Kathy like a lot and was really worried about not finding one. And as everybody told me, you'll find one, it'll be okay, and it all worked out, so. <laughs> um, just to speak on that, so the Career Services runs a Rollins Opportunity Link. Um, so it's an online portal where our alumni and various employers that have connections with Rollins students are allowed to post applications. So there's constant opportunities um, available for us. You just, it's all posted in one link. So it's on UTAB, Kate, to check that as well. Um, and then how is it balancing first semester courses and doing an internship? So it's definitely depending on your finances. I think to much of my parents' dismay, I did not work the first semester. <laughs> um, I The first semester is a bit of adjustment. It's when most of your classes are, and there's some of your more intense classes. Um, it's definitely, I know people that did it. I personally didn't. I waited until the spring to um, do an internship. 
but I don't, did you? Yeah. I did work. Um, so it is possible, I survived. Um, but as Kathy and Brittany mentioned earlier, um, your first semester in the MPH program is the more of the structured of the semesters. Um, so the class times, you really have to fit those into your schedule. I personally work, your parents would still not be happy. I work <laughs> nonprofit, so no pay. Um, <laughs> but it was 12 to 15 hours a week is what I was putting in during the first semester, and I balanced um, in the grade school, so it works. <laughs> it definitely depends on your organization skills and how you are as a student. and It's kind of a personal decision, yeah. I would say. And I, this is Sarah Blake. I just want to also emphasize that while you may choose to work your, during your first semester, your practicum hours, your internship hours, if you want those to go towards your practicum, cannot be counted until spring. So if it's been a while since you've been in, in school and you, you know that you're going to need some adjustment, I personally would recommend that you just take that first semester and get into the groove of being in graduate school. It is going to be a, a shift uh, in terms of the workload and the expectations, so give yourself a break if you can uh, and wait until the spring. However, we do know that for some students, they do need to work. I certainly worked in grad school, <laughs> uh, needed to. But So just know that your practicum hours do not start until spring. All right, so um, Hillary is asking, what is the average age of the HPM class? Uh, 27. Yeah, 25. Yeah, so about 40% of our students come in straight from undergrad, and about 60% are coming in with work experience. And so that kind of, um, and our HPM, I think, is more common to, to come in with work experience. Yeah, we have, I mean, it's a mix. And yeah. So we have a lot of students coming straight from undergrad. And I get this question a lot of students saying, do I have the prereqs to be, you know, to move into this? Any student that's accepted, you are highly qualified. That's why you were accepted to the program. But we understand we have a very a wide variety of students coming in with their background of undergrad. Some have business, some have more anthropology, some have sociology or pre-med. So our classes, when it says intro to econ, that's what it is. It's intro. Now, it'll take off. There'll be students that may start and be a little more uh, familiar with a certain topic. but we work through and get everybody to the same page by midterm, so everybody will be fine. But um, we, I get those questions a lot. <laughs> I took a year off in between undergrad and graduate um, just because I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. So that was kind of a year to find myself. Um, so I did work in the state health department for a year. I think you're, did you come straight up? You're straight from undergrad. Garrett came straight from undergrad. So if you have questions about that, we both have a little different perspective in that. Um, and uh, my undergrad degree was very sciencey. Um, I have a health science degree with like a biology minor and an English minor. So like I came very sciencey. And so I was a little terrified of econ and accounting, but I ended up being an econ TA. So it's like totally fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, and I am a TA, so if you have questions about kind of classes, I can help answer some of those as well. Um, all right, Celia is asking, um, would Brittany and Garrett be able to talk about their internships, about how many hours um, do they intern every week? So I think you guys have kind of touched on some of this. I know, Garrett, you said you did 12 to 15 hours a week. So I do, right now, 15, 16-ish. Um, my boss is very flexible with my schedule, fortunately. I am at the CDC um, in the Division of State Local Readiness, so it's a little crazy right now with the Zika virus. Mm -hmm. um, I started in October. Uh, it kind of just depends. You can't work more than 20 hours, um, but you don't want it to run out. You only have a certain amount of hours you can, well, if you're on the real mm -hmm. award, which I am, um, you can only work a certain amount of hours. So I kind of have to budget it and figure it out, and it also depends on what my boss needs. Um, and then because I am a TA, I have more hours I have to do, so it, I kind of have to balance a little, um, but it's totally doable. It, just works with your boss. Um, usually they'll post how many hours they kind of want someone for, and they'll have a range, and so it's definitely something to talk with them about. I think last year I worked about 12 hours a week. And could you guys maybe give like an example of like a project or like your duties within your, like what you're doing, like mm -hmm. to actually doing for your internship? Um, so I am their head intern at the community center that I work for. Um, I'm not on the real program, um, so you guys, it's, we'll just show you the vet. Like, you can get a experience if yes. you're not, or if you are on um, the real work. 
Um, so I, as I said, I am their intern. I have a team of 17 interns underneath me. Um, I run a initiative that, so for funding by January 2017, my clinic needs 7,000 total patients in our database. Right now we're at 2,800. Um, so my CEO has tasked me with the project to come up with the strategic plan um, and implement that to help the clinic um, raise their numbers. So it's, it's community outreach as well as um, going in and looking at their operation team and making it more effective. So I've had two internships, so I'll kind of talk about um, main projects I've worked on. The first one at Georgia Watch, because it's a small nonprofit, when I came in they were working on a research project looking at um, nonprofit hospitals in Georgia, um, various areas, looking at their community health needs assessments, um, and kind of doing a qualitative study, a literature review, um, on the various portions of it, and seeing if they were following IRS requirements and how well, and how that was affecting the community, because they watch out for vulnerable populations. They wanted to be sure that um, these nonprofit hospitals were, in fact, providing some of the community benefits that they needed to be for their tax break. Um, and so kind of we did some qualitative um, research on that. So I got some good experience with that. And I helped kind of create the charts and stuff. So it was really nice for experience um, and be able to put on my resume that I helped with this report. And then we also did like a webinar about it. So I did get some deliverables out of that. And then where I'm at now at the CDC, um, so <laughs> things have kind of been shifted around because the emergency has been activated here. Um, but I am working with like historical data, um, kind of pulling together these awardee profiles, which is basically a profile on each US state and territory, um, kind of some information that executive leaders would need if they went out to that state. Um, so right now I'm pulling together Zika stuff. And since there's not a lot about it, it's kind of like I have to be intuitive of what they might need. So it is a really good experience, um, especially being around during an emergency situation as such. And I kind of get to sit on some meetings. So it's a really, really cool experience just being able to do that as a student. You know. um, Hillary's asking, what career services are offered for HPM students? And how do they compare to services offered to students doing the dual MBA MPH degree? OK, I can answer that. This is Kathy. Uh, we have uh, usually a small cohort of five to six MBA students. The resources through career service are exactly the same for any student, domestic, international, dual degree. It's all the same. And career services does an excellent job. And we even work uh, and have some events with uh, the Goizueta Business School, which is here at Emory, and they'll do uh, different meetings and have you know uh, an event where students can come that are both MBA and both public health. So the resources, uh, again, it was mentioned earlier, Career Services does an excellent job, and they're available to help students uh, by reviewing resumes, doing mock interviews in order to prepare students so that when you're ready for the official interview, you are on track and have all items in order. Mm -hmm. And they do a lot of really creative events. Like um, this past Wednesday, they partnered with the Ann Taylor Loft that's across the street yep. from our from we we have a, a shopping center kind of across the street from our building, and they partnered with the Ann Taylor Loft. Mm -hmm. And from seven to eight thirty last night, the store itself was closed down. Mm -hmm. Or on Wednesday night, the store itself was closed down and was open only to our students. Mm -hmm. and um, gave them a 15% discount, had some like wine and snacks and things like that. And mm -hmm. the, the people there within the, um, the, the, the workers at the store were there to kind of help students with like identifying appropriate clothes for interviews yeah. and for, for work, work appropriate clothes. Because it can be really hard to make that transition. Yeah, because a lot of students will ask if it's says business casual, yeah, what if is, it's business, and what's expected of them yeah. as a student. And we always say, always overdo dress professional mm -hmm. until you know otherwise. Mm -hmm. And if you start a position, and for example, at CDC, you may be, be expected to be dressed a certain way, but if they say, oh, it's a relaxed environment, then you'll know at that time. But always go in you know, expecting to be dressed professionally. Yeah, but they just do a lot of really kind of creative events like that that I don't think you most places do. <laughs> In addition to a great uh, 
career services, as I mentioned. At orientation, I remember them specifically saying that it's run exactly. We pride ourselves that we're a professional career services. Um, so it's really geared toward getting us into the next steps um, and really building that relationship with us. Um, I just wanted to mention, because it seemed like you had various interests um, for the business school, as Kathy mentioned. Um, we are we do multiple events with them. I attended a healthcare forum over at the business school um, where I got to meet the MBA students also interested in healthcare and we got to um, talk about our different perspectives on things. Um, but part of your curriculum is you have electives um, and throughout the your end semesters the graduate various graduate schools will release a set of electives that you are allowed to take. So if you do have various interests you are allowed to take business school classes. You're allowed to take some law school classes. Mm -hmm. I even have um, friends that are at Emory undergrad taking more like a science-based class. Say they want to go to medical school as their next step. Um, you can always, always take any of those classes as well. Yes, and on that same note, uh, Emory is flat tuition, so you pay a certain tuition each semester. So whether you take nine credit hours or 15, it's the same cost, so it's a good thing to take advantage of that. So if you would, as Garrett mentioned, take something at the business school, that's not an additional charge, or at the college, and so we will work with you and provide what classes are available. So we do have a business school, nursing has like a Spanish for healthcare professionals, a class offered there, we do get law and some in bioethics. So there's a lot of offerings of elective outside that can build on a skill set, but give you that interest if you want to uh, take a business school class, you could have that opportunity at no additional charge. All right, Grace is asking, um, are most of the courses around the same time of day, or are most of the courses around the same time each day, or are they spread out to where students are on campus most of the day? Um, I think it's how you schedule. Um, your first semester, anyways, is very structured, so you don't really have much flexibility with that. But after that, it depends on what electives you want. If you don't want to take an 8 a.m., you don't have to. If you don't want to take a Friday class. Um, this semester, for instance, I have class on Monday and Tuesday, and then one morning on Wednesday. So I have Thursday and Friday off to work. Um, but my days are kind of long, so it really just depends on how you want to schedule it. Um, I, like, I work in between classes, so I'll go to class in the morning, and then I'll go to work, and then I'll go to night class or something. So. It really just is how you personally structure it, at least in your second year. Yeah, and it's the same as your first year. There are set times for certain classes that you have to meet, um, but as Brittany mentioned, it's pretty flexible. Right now, I have I jammed everything into my Monday and then kept every um, all my other classes in the morning spread throughout the week. Um, so I have the afternoons to be involved in campus leadership and balance my work life as well. And there are no classes over the lunch hour. Um, so from noon to one every day, that's free, which is really nice for meetings because um, you know everybody can do group meetings or we have snack time in the HPM department during that time. Um, or there will be like lunch and learns or various speakers that you know you can attend because it's during this time when you don't have class. I told you, free food. There's always free food around that time. All right, Joseph is asking about what is the culture at Rollins and what do you enjoy most about Rollins? Culture is pretty broad, but um, okay. So I would say the HPM department. Anyways, I can't really speak to other departments, but the HPM, I would say we're pretty close knit um, because we are small. You kind of know everybody in your class at least. Um, I have an advantage of knowing some of the first years from being a TA, but you kind of get to know people. Um, so it's pretty close knit, a pretty good culture. There's a lot of social events too, so you do get to know people. Um, our representatives do a good job of putting on social events as well, like snack time, anything with free food. Um, and so you get to know people through that. Um, I would say it's definitely a community. Um, I think that's the biggest, my biggest, uh, what I like most about Rollins is the culture that's created here. Um, I was nervous. I came from a very small um, undergrad institution. I did too. <laughs> and I heard going to a big university, I'm going to be in this graduate program. That's going to be a very different environment. Here, it's not competitive. Mm -hmm. Where everyone, it's very community-based, um, and we're all kind of came here to like change public health, and we all came with that passion. Although our interests lie in different um, arenas in public health, but we all really came to make that change, um, and I think that really creates a, as we said, a community 
um, and lots of social events. I think one nice thing is you can always find people in one of the basements. Um, there's a lot of couches and computer set up and if you have any questions on like homework especially during your first semester when everybody's working on the same stuff you can always walk down and find somebody there one of your classmates who's working on it as well so it's not like Garrett said it's not competitive at all everybody works together um, to help each other out even when it's not group assignments you find yourself kind of working in a group to really make sure everybody's succeeding yeah. all right Archon is asking can international students in healthcare management track intern at the CDC and are there opportunities available that suit the management track? Yes, students can. Now there'll be specific and career services is really good if there's any restrictions for if it's an international student and any company that has restrictions based on that has to be a domestic student. It's all very clearly listed. You would never apply to a position. And we have a person designated in career services to help international students with their uh, career goals. But there's lots of opportunities for students to work while they're here. Mm -hmm. um, Arshan is asking, are there any specific um, healthcare management or student orgs on campus? Not that I know of. We have a lot of student orgs, but they tend to focus, like we've got our... The more specific topic. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. There is Academy Health, um, which a lot of, well, it's... A lot of chapter? Chapter? Yeah, there's a student chapter. Yeah, there's yeah. A student chapter. It's yeah. pretty small, but they're mm -hmm. trying to make it more well known. I don't know if it's necessarily management, like it's mm -hmm. more well, HPM well, specific, well, yeah. but they do various topics. So they'll have like topics on QI, uh, quality improvement initiatives, or something. So that might be more management. That's what sparked. Uh, I'm part of Institute for Healthcare Improvement yeah, they as well. That. Yeah. Um, so that is more. If you're interested in quality improvement, but you get lots of management skills and networking opportunities through it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, as we said, it's like varying your interests, but there are lots of management opportunities. Yeah, and ways to get involved on campus kind of revolving around that. Yeah. And there's a lot of different like speakers that will come on campus, so you'll have options and ways to get involved. And um, then Archana is asking about how to join the Student Government Association. So that's a, um, so the Rollins Student Government Association is kind of the umbrella that manages all of our other student orgs. And um, in order to be on the Student Government Association, it's an election process. And so we've got um, de two department reps from each department, and then an executive board consisting of president, vice president, uh, three social chairs, two student activity chairs, a treasurer, um, communication a communications officer. officer and a secretary yes. and I think that's everybody on the e-board so um, and those elections happen in November of, um, of each year and and then the you hold office for a calendar year from January to, to, to December basically so and Garrett is one of our HPM reps um, let's see what's next up um, pool Dibian and again, my apologies if I'm completely butchering names. Um, looks like I think asking about um, PhD possibilities. What are the options to study after MPH and HPM to increase my career opportunities? And what are the work destinations I should expect after MPH health policy? So it looks like kind of asking about um, jobs after graduation and maybe the possibility of a PhD, like what options in PhDs that we offer. Okay. So. As I mentioned about, this is Sarah Blake, um, so many, well, I would say about 20 to 30% of our MSPH students uh, enter that specific track um, or program because they are interested in uh, a future doctoral program or doctoral degree. Um, so the MSPH track really helps those students because it helps build a lot of the research and analytic skills that are necessary to enter into a PhD program. It is very quantitative uh, in nature, as uh, Kathy mentioned, but it also helps uh, the students learn to and design their own research project via the thesis. We do have a PhD program here in health policy and management. Um, we take about three to four students per year. If you are interested in the PhD program, you do need to separately apply for that program. We offer um, about two slots for the economics track and there's one slot for political science. For those students who enter the political science track of our PhD, they also take classes uh, at our Laney School, our graduate school um, that is separate from the Rollins School of Public Health. 
But in general, um, could, does this help you, prepare you for a PhD program? It certainly gives you advanced training in the field of health policy and management, but it is not a specific segue into any PhD program here at the Rollins School of Public Health. All right, Arshan is asking, are there research or teaching assistantships within the HPM department? Brittany, you talked about one you hold right yeah, now. Yeah, so there are definitely opportunities. Um, research opportunities will usually be posted in like the uh, Rollins Opportunity Link. Um, there's a lot of them in various departments. You don't necessarily have to be in that department. If you meet the different skills, you can work in the BSHE or Global Health or whatever. Um, Dr. Blake has some opportunities right now available. Um, I am, am a TA. I was a TA for the health econ intro to health economics and then the evaluation for economic, economic. yeah, economic evaluation of healthcare. That. Um, <laughs> so the TAs are chosen by the professors. They will contact um, after the class. They'll con email you and kind of ask you. Um, so if you're really interested in a class and you really want to be a TA, start talking to the teacher and go visit them um, and kind of express your interest in that. There's no application for that. It just kind of comes along to you. But the research opportunities are definitely posted, um, so you can apply for those. All right, Vanita is asking, can you give a few examples of the range of job titles and responsibilities when first graduating from the program? Yes, well, that can vary based on the individual, because we have some students that come in and they have several years of work experience, so their position may go in at a higher level. Some students who straight from undergrad, the practicum is what's so relevant to students because you get that opportunity to work and then that can lead into a full-time placement. So it's according to where you're at. So to say it would be an entry-level position if you have no work experience and let's just use an example. If you started working at the Emory Clinic and you were helping discuss patient flow, how things are working, then when you come in, it'd be according to the title at that company. You know, so the Emory may have it set up that you would be uh, a manager of this certain process, you know. So it really varies according to what company has posted, but and then based on your years of experience uh, upon hiring. And on the um, Rollins website in our career section, they post um, five years worth of employment surveys. So our Career Services Office does a phenomenal survey of our alumni one year after graduation. And we get something like 97, 98% return rate mm -hmm. of, of our alumni filling out this survey. And it's broken down by department. So you can go back and look for the past five years where our, um, MP, where our HPM alumni are. Um, and keep in mind that it's just one year after graduation um, because salary is included in that. So when you're seeing the salary range, you know, remember that it's only one year of experience, you know, coming straight out with your MPH, mm -hmm. that that's being considered. You know, this isn't necessarily someone that's been out of the MPH program for five, six years or anything like that. But I think those are great resources because it gives um, the company that they're working at and their job title. And it also gives salary range and things like that. And you can go back and look at that for five years. Um... Uh, Archana is asking, do students and faculty within HPM attend any national or regional conferences? I know we attend APHA, um, which is the uh, American Public Health Association, right. um, which is a big one. This is Sarah Blake. So uh, you heard it uh, just a few minutes ago, but the Academy Health is really the main conference um, for health services research and health policy. Um, that is the name of the organization, Academy Health, and every year faculty attend um, and often present at that conference. So we do encourage our students, particularly our MSPH students who've done some research and want to highlight their own work to submit uh, in a student panel. But a number of our students also attend APHA, the American Public Health Association Conference, which is in the fall. Again, attending that um, or presenting our different opportunities as well. And I believe second year students, I may be speaking out of turn, SGA will provide a little bit of a travel mm -hmm. stipend, I believe, yes, to attend for, for, anybody. for a conference. And then if you're if you're actually presenting, as Sarah mentioned, uh, we've had students present and then we as a department will uh, help fund that mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, if, it, we if try to present. Yeah, if you're presenting and then SGA does, you, can, you have to apply for it a few months in advance through SGA. Mm -hmm. It's not something you just come back and say, oh, I need this money for. Mm -hmm. But those, those options are there. Um, all right, so we I think we've got enough time to hopefully wrap up. All, we're right at noon, but there's only like four more questions. 
So um, I think I, Sarah's got to go. Sarah Blake's got to get out, but I think we'll be able to get in the rest of these questions really quickly. So Jenna, both Jenna and Anchara are asking um, about financial financial aid. So Jenna's question is, I've been accepted and ex am extremely excited for the fall. Congratulations, Jenna. But I am concerned about the finances. Is there an opportunity to be on federal aid for scholarships? Further, how or about what percentage of students are able to receive scholarships and fellowships? So um, the most important thing that you could be doing right now, Jenna and everyone else, all 23 of you that are still out there listening, is fill out your FAFSA. Mm -hmm. I can't say that enough. Like if you haven't done it, like do it yesterday. Like just get it done and get it filled out. Even if you haven't done your taxes yet, because as we all, you know, for those of you that have filled it out in the past, it is tax based. Um, you can put in your estimates based on, you know, last year. And then once you do your taxes, you can go back in and, and put in the exact amounts. Um, we offer, there are several funding opportunities outside of our merit-based awards, which if you got your application in by the January 5th deadline, you are automatically considered for those merit-based awards. Those notifications will be going out within the next two weeks. But keep in mind, those are incredibly competitive, and we award about 40 of those. Whereas through our FAFSA awards, through our need-based awards, that's things like REAL, the Rollins Earn and Learn program, which is a work-study program. We've got um, a new award this year called the Rollins Pathway Award, which is an $8,000 award um, given over two years, so $4,000 a year. Um, if you're a, Peace, a return Peace Corps volunteer and you get accepted in the program, that's an automatic $10,000. If you're a AmeriCorps alumni, um, and accepted, that's an automatic $6,000. Um, we have a, a scholarship that's been endowed by a donor called the Letty Pate Whitehead Award, and that is um, a, an award for Southern Christian women. Um, and so that's been one that um, has continued to grow through that endowment, through that endowed, endowed foundation. Um, so be sure that you indicate that on your SOFUS, SOFUS application when they do ask for religion. Um, let's see, there's a handful of other need-based awards as well, and all of these are only done or administrated, administered via your FAFSA. So you could only be um, eligible to those if you get those, and if you fill out that form. And I know that um, some of you may be concerned about FAFSA thinking, oh, well, in undergrad, I was never eligible, I'm still a dependent on my parents, and, and they make too much, I'm never going to be considered for it. Grad school financial aid is um, calculated very differently than undergrad um, in a much different manner. Even if you are still a dependent of your parents as a graduate student, their income is not factored in when you're applying for financial aid for grad school. So don't think that you know just because you had um, an experience like that in undergrad that it's going to be the same thing. So just get it filled out. That's the number one thing to walk away with this. And I think this can kind of um, can kind of also um, bounce off on Chara's um, question about scholarships available. Are scholarships available for HPM students yearly, or are merit-based scholarships awarded only to incoming students? So the merit-based awards are only a re reviewed in your first incoming year. But things like um, if you are awarded real as an incoming student, um, that's a two-year award, so you're guaranteed it for um, your first and second year. You still have to fill out FAFSA, um, so that's important. Um, but um, it is um, it, there are some other options. Like once, you, if you continue to fill out your FAFSA your first and second your second year, those need-based awards you would still be eligible for. But merit-based awards are only for um, the first incoming year. And this is in the admissions package. Yes. Yes. Um, absolutely. And um, all of your financial aid awards will be made in late March, mid to late March, and those will be in your opus. You'll, you'll find your financial aid award package in your opus, and that's where you find out if you've got real or, or anything else outside of our merit awards. All right, and it looks to be our last question. We've got Joseph. He's asking, um, what did you guys do the summer before you enrolled? Like, before I enrolled. Yeah, like the summer um, before you came here. I worked at the Iowa Department of Public Health, um, where I had been for about a year, um, kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. Um, so I just worked and tried to save a little money, um, because moving to Atlanta for me was a bit more expensive, coming from 
middle of Iowa. Um, so that's what I did. Um, I had a nice summer back home in California um, because I moved out at 17 to go to college in Boston. Um, so I've always been I've been away from the home, and I was an orientation leader in undergrad. Um, so I always went back for the summer. So it was actually the longest concurrent period of time that I've had at home um, since high school. So it was good to be back. I'm a mama's boy, so um, she loves when I'm home. If you're moving far away, definitely take advantage of just being at home and hitting up all the things that you might miss. I know I had like a list of places I wanted to hit, all the different food places and different things um, that I wanted to explore with friends because it is kind of hard to get back. Um, being so far, I don't know how often you go home, but I go home about like once a year for Christmas when it's snowy and cold. So I so I really just kind of enjoyed it, um, took advantage of those things that I liked. And it's also not uncommon for some students to come out here early. You know, if, if you are moving, some of our students do, you know, maybe move out in June or July. Um, you know, most leases for apartments, uh, most students are signing leases for apartments starting in August. Um, but, you know, there's subletting opportunities or something. So if you're just looking to get into the city early to get settled before classes start, that's also an option too. So um, there's no wrong or right way to do it, just whatever works best for your situation. So um, that seems to be it on questions and we are just now a few minutes over. So I appreciate you guys staying with us to um, hear all the rest of our questions. And um, thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. We, like I said, we were recording this, so I'll email out the link to everybody once this is on our um, YouTube channel. Um, and with that, I think, oh, thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Um, so I do want to plug um, Visit Emory. So for those of you that are on here that are admitted, um, Visit Emory, you've already received some communications about it, but um, if you haven't, be sure that you're checking out our, our admitted student event, March 31st and April 1st. It's a great way to come and see the campus. Um, we offer campus tours, class visits, a reception with our dean and faculty, social events hosted by student orgs, um, a research and opportunities fair, uh, student panels on like how to find housing, minority student life here, um, financial aid has drop in hours. I mean, we just, we try to provide everything you would need to know. Did either of you attend Visit Emory? Yeah, I did. And it really, really, really was helpful, especially just to be on campus and kind of experience the community. There were a few schools I was debating between and that kind of sealed the deal for me of I wanted to be here. I just felt at place here and just felt like I belonged. Um, and we'll be there. There will be a student panel. You can ask any more questions. Um, yeah. And you get to meet your department. You'll meet Kathy. You'll meet our wonderful students here, Garrett and Brittany. Um, and we do offer some travel grants for that. So you can email me directly. It's Emily, E-M-I-L-Y dot lake maker l a k e m a k e r at emory dot edu so it's just emily dot lake maker at emory dot edu so feel free to email me or if you want to you know email kathy here her email is right up here on the screen she can put you in contact with me um whoever you know we can make sure that you get the information on how to apply for those travel grants if um, funding may be a concern to you. We also have a lot of really kind students that open up their home to host students um, when they come. Um, and so we have a lot of um, Visit Emory attendees that do that. So that help cuts on the cost as well because you're not having to pay for a hotel. Um, and the sign up for that is on um, the Visit Emory registration page on our admitted student portal. So between travel grant and staying with a current student, um, it can be a very feasible thing for, for you to be able to attend because we know we'd hate for cost to be a reason for anyone not to come. Um, okay, so I think with that, we are for real going to close off. Um, so thanks so much for joining us, everybody. And um, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions.